Welcome to Point and Click, uh, and today we have an interview with a certain gentleman who at least claims to be Al Lowe, but um, actually I did some research online and Al Lowe looks about like this. <laughs> this gentleman is... I'm not sure. There are similarities, so uh, I was thinking that we could have a small quiz in the start, if you don't mind. You could maybe prove your uh, identity. Good, then I can ask you all the questions to prove who you are. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll paste the questions in the text so you can check them, but I'll read them out loud. Okay, John Williams is A, a famous composer, B, uh, Sierra's former marketing director, C, neither of the above, or D, both of the above. Well, uh, both of the above, if you use different John Williams, but John Williams that, I, it, that is uh, pertinent to Sierra was our marketing director. And he was Ken Williams, a uh, younger brother. Yes, okay. Fair enough. Let's, let's try the next one. The next question is... So this, so this is, is payback, payback for me asking, asking all those trivia, trivia quizzes, quizzes before, before you could get into the game. game. <laughs> it could be, it could be, seeing us... <laughs> That maybe. Larry King is a, a TikToker, a talk show host, Larry Laffer's nickname for himself, or uh, the King of Sweden? <laughs> well, I don't know who the King of Sweden is, but Larry King's a talk show host. <laughs> Used okay. to be. I think he's not anymore. Yeah, I think he's not doing that gig or any other gig anymore. But yeah, that's, that, that's the right answer. Okay. And then, so far so good, but now the final one, and this is a special one. Okay, the question is... <laughs> Kenen tunnettu sketsihahmo on Maria Tyrni? A. Riku Nieminen, B. Antti Holma, C. Kiti Kokkonen, or D. Aku Hirviniemi? <laughs> e. E, okay. Well, it's close enough. It's the correct answer is D. So I just wanted uh, to give you a simulation what it was to try to answer a question where you don't un understand the language. And even if you did, you wouldn't <laughs> understand the question. Okay, okay, I guess you're all low then. <laughs> okay, Al, uh, welcome to the show and thank you for taking the time to uh, have this little chat around the world. I understand you've been to uh, Finland at least once before. I have, indeed. I went to uh, Alpfest uh, um, 10 years ago at least. I don't know what year it was. Maybe 2008, something like that. Long time ago, yeah. Yeah, I, I saw footage. You actually played some saxophone there and uh, did some other did. fun things. Had a speech and stuff. Hey Al, um, you uh, haven't always been, a, you are not currently a game designer I guess and you haven't always been a game designer but uh, you, uh, you did something else before making games. Tell us something about your youth and uh, life before. Well I, I was always interested in music um, and uh, I was a, a, a a proto geek, I guess you'd say. I mean, I, I, I was always the kid in school who would fix the film projector when it, when it broke or, um, uh, build the speaker cabinets for the band or, uh, resolder the cables on the microphones when they went bad. Um, I, I was always that kind of guy. So when I learned about computers, it, it to me, it just seemed like, Oh God, this is the ultimate toy because um you, you know you can build all kind of stuff with it itself and um i wasn't sure what i would do with a computer if i had one but i just knew i had to have one um so i convinced my wife that we should spend a month of our combined salaries at the time and we ended up with a Apple II with 48K of memory, because I couldn't afford all 64K. Uh, 
Um, let's see, 16, 16 K of memory costs sixteen K two hundred dollars. Can you imagine? <laughs> I, I, I can I can easily imagine. Yeah. I I have some yeah. recollection of that time, like not that exact <laughs> time, but p time period. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so anyway, I was uh, always interested in that kind of stuff. I I be, was a professional musician for uh, during high school and college. I, that was my only job. I put myself through school uh, playing music, and um, uh, when I graduated from college from university, I became a music teacher. I taught various public schools, and I did that for about 15 years uh, until I got an Apple II and uh, thought, I, this is just too much fun. I've got to do something with this. And uh, because I had a background in education, it was simple to write some educational games, and that's how I got started um, in, in uh, software. Uh, I did that for 15 years, and um, one day, Sierra... Uh, became the victim of a hostile takeover and uh, the company was uh, stolen from Ken and Roberta Williams by uh, crooks, thieves. Um, and I can say that with impunity because uh, they were actually convicted in U.S. federal court and ended up going to prison and spending years hopefully breaking big rocks into little ones. I don't know. But uh Anyway, uh, so I stayed with Sierra for uh, 15 years, and, and um, it was a great time of my life. I enjoyed it a lot, but I've been retired now for longer than that. Uh, um, I guess it's been 22 years uh, that I've been retired. Yeah, time does fly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, these uh, these events have been uh, uh, talked about in many other uh, interviews. I actually read Ken Williams's book about maybe when it, it came out about half half a year ago or something yes where he mm -hmm. talked about the cuc and the very dirty <laughs> dirty actions that took place in the late 90s or mid 90s i guess yeah, yeah. um but we'll go to the beginning beginning t at sierra when you uh you came there after you were in a in an apple expo or something where you met ken williams I think <laughs> if I well, read the I, I, uh, I, went I went to, to a, a computer, computer show. show, Computer Using Educators was the show. And I looked at the state of the software that was there and gosh, it was just terrible. I mean, this was 1982 and there were no games. Uh, everything was very rote learning, um, like exercises out of a book. Um, and I had had some experience uh, with computers before that. I, um, uh, the school district where I worked had a mini computer and they were foolish enough to give me an access code and a password and an account number. And, uh, uh, and I said, well, I have this great idea for a computer program. And they handed me this big thick manual about this big uh, and said, uh, okay, here's the basic programming manual. Go do it yourself. because We don't need the manual because no one here, no real programmer would ever use basic. <laughs> so <laughs> they literally <laughs> said that. So, okay. anyways, anyways, I took the manual home and I read it and uh, I realized, oh, well, th this problem I have is just kind of a lot of math problems. I could just write all this stuff down in the computer and it would work. Now today, it would, you know, you'd make an Excel spreadsheet to do this. But then I wrote a basic program that added up math and did particular algorithms. And, and um, I had no idea what I was doing, but I had a buddy who was a computer programmer. And every once in a while, I'd call him up and say, hey, Art, what can I do? I need help. <laughs> How do I do this? And uh, he, he would help me out. So I, I taught myself to program on a, a DEC mini computer in DEC Basic. Uh, and then when the Apple IIs came out about a year later, um, I convinced my wife that we should buy one. Um, and uh, I was going to make us rich by uh, this uh, uh, creating a integrated music festival management software package consisting of 20 programs that did different uh, solve different problems when you ran a music festival. Now, 
that was what I did uh, for the school district and what my wife did and other people. And so we had a built in proving ground for this for this product. Um, Sadly, that did not become the way we got we get great wealth, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it did teach me a good lesson about programming and write, about writing bulletproof code. Uh, and so um, when I went to the computer conference and saw the state of educational software at the time, I thought, well, hell, I can do better than this. Um, my son and I were playing uh, Sierra games. It wasn't Sierra then; it was online systems. But uh, uh, we enjoyed playing adventure games together. And he was young, um, uh, couldn't type, couldn't read, but he could look at the pictures and I would read him the text and he would figure out, you know, he was equally good at figuring out solutions to the puzzles and stuff. So that's what we did. We played adventure games together. Um, And therefore, it seemed likely that if I made a game, it would be like that. So what I did was make an adventure game that was suitable for a six-year-old uh, to play by themselves. Um, and as far as I know, it was the first uh, uh, game of that sort, uh, educational game for the Apple II. Um, Spinnaker Software came out at that about that same time, uh, and they had some games that were games first and educational also, uh, like I did. But uh, I was right in the forefront of that whole project. Well, we took our games to... Apple Fest in 1982, and I vividly remember uh, uh, it, we bought a, the smallest booth we could buy, which was 10 by 10 feet, I think, which was way too big for the little products, that, the only two products we had. Um, but we uh, uh, set up our programs and uh, did demonstrations, and various publishers all came by every major publisher in the industry was uh, there at that show and they all came by and said you don't want to be a a publisher you want to be a designer uh you should write more games let us sell you know thousands of games for you and um, and that sounded pretty good because uh, at the point at that point my wife and i were spending our uh, free time um stuffing plastic bags and copying discs and uh, dressing and waiting for the UPS man to show up. And yeah, it was the, the, the whole publishing part of it didn't have much appeal to us where the designing and writing and creative parts did. So, so I, I, what, that's, uh, of that, all the, the people, people we, we talked talk? with, we ended up uh, um, going with Sierra. They had the best offer and they were also the nearest, the closest to our home. So that's how uh, the, the rest is history, I guess. Is, is it yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely history, and uh, the the zip bag method worked well for Ken and Roberta a few years before, but times had changed yeah. very rapidly, I guess. Like yeah, yeah they, they actually, actually were, were uh, by the, the time, time we, we signed, signed with them, they, they were actually, actually putting, putting their, their games in cardboard, cardboard boxes. boxes. Yeah, that's, that's progress. progress. Yeah, and uh, then you. Uh, <laughs> Then you joined Sierra, and uh, there were about like 20, 30 workers at that time, I guess. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think uh, there were about 20 employees when I joined, and that was the year that Sierra expanded rapidly. Uh, within six months or so after I signed on, uh, Sierra was up to 120 employees. Um, and then came Black Friday. Uh, the original and, uh, Black Friday. <laughs> Yeah, and that uh, that afternoon, Sierra had 40 employees, and they let everybody go, 80 of us go, including me, um, with the understanding that uh, uh, I would no longer earn a salary, but I would earn royalties on products that I actually shipped, uh, which was better for them and turned out to be better for me because now I got paid on... Um, advances against future royalties, uh, and then royalties when the product sold. Um, so that, that's the way I worked for the next 15 years at Sierra. Well, I had, I was a contract employee, I, or not a contract. I was an outside contractor as opposed to an employee. So no, uh, uh, yeah, it worked out well. <laughs> yeah. Who knew? And, uh, it must have been quite a feeling to uh, 
jump from teaching to making like official licensed Disney games in a span of few well, years. It, it, it was, was there were a couple, couple steps, steps in between, between uh, where I made my own games, games and yeah. uh, uh, but at uh, at that, that same, same show, show where um, I hooked up with Sierra, uh, Ken obtained the rights to the Disney characters. So when he brought me on as a full time designer, uh, it made sense for me to tackle uh, Disney characters and uh, use those licenses. We did it for a few years, but what we found was that the Disney, at that time, licensed characters were not an advantage in a game. In fact, they were a disadvantage. It, uh, I think at the time, most licensed software was pretty crappy software. Um, and uh, uh, people enjoyed originality and different products and stuff. And so, so it was interesting because... Sierra was creating the same kinds of products, but Disney was taking all the profits. Yeah, and it was, it was like, like, well, why are we doing all this work and Disney make all the money? Uh, so they, get, you know, it just what didn't make business sense at that time. Now, later, you know, things changed and suddenly, you know, uh, I would uh, love to have the Pixar rights at this <laughs> yeah. point. But, but uh, yeah, for, for, for a year or two, two, I was, I was Walt, Walt Disney, Disney software. software. <laughs> yeah, that's smart. <laughs> That's so many people can say the same. I think Scott Murphy did some, uh, the, and you worked with Scott with uh, well, Black Cauldron. Yeah, Scott, Scott worked on, on Black, Black Cauldron, Cauldron for a while. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah and he, I, I think I, think I actually, actually uh, trained him in uh, AGI. Uh, AGI was a the language that we used back then, but it was never formalized. It was much more a collection of subroutines that, uh, than it was an actual language. And um, uh, I learned by sitting next to Ken, uh, and he would program something and show me, and then I would program some more stuff, and I would get it wrong, and he would correct me, and then I would do things. And so then I did the same with Scott and uh, uh, several other programmers as well. So it took a long time before we were organized enough to actually offer instruction of any kind in, in the language yeah and um, and uh, with the AGI came lots of hits to uh, Sierra like King's Quest and uh, Space Quest and then a certain white suited <laughs> adventurer came along <laughs> so uh, La Larry Larry was your breakthrough hit I guess if you had several, uh, different kind of breakthroughs before, but then along came Larry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Larry uh, uh, certainly changed my life. Uh, part of it was because um, Ken was in financial difficulties at that time and um, didn't have a lot of cash flow. Um, and so he said, well, if you can take no advances on your next game, I could give you a higher royalty rate. And I said, oh, well, that sounds good uh, because my games had all sold up until that point. And so, yeah, sure, higher royalties, that, that sounds good. Uh, so it was good for him because he didn't have to give me money up front. Uh, uh, and it would have been good for me if the game had sold. But because it was adultish in nature... Sure. Uh, um, many stores, stores didn't take it, uh, and uh, it uh, was the worst selling product in the history of the company uh, at a time when normal games sold 40 or 50,000 copies out the door. Larry sold 4,000 copies the first month, and I was just sick. I mean, I had wasted four months of my life uh, you know, on this thing, and I'd taken no advances. Uh, so thank God my wife was still employed as a teacher because we were living off her salary. And uh, thank God for wives. Uh, it, it, yeah, and and uh, but piracy was very widespread then. Uh, I guess as it still is. But the um, uh, uh, Larry wasn't very well copy protected, uh, and so it was um, a very popular game. But not a uh, not a high selling game. But it was odd because the um, uh, growth rate, uh, if you looked at it on a chart, it looked like this. I mean, it would start down here and then it just got bigger and bigger 
every month. month. And, and after, after a year, it finally broke into the top 10 uh, with a bullet <laughs> as an upcoming star. And, it was, and we were already doing the second game. I mean, it was already over. So, <laughs> so it was an odd, odd way to say. I'd like to think that we invented shareware. Um, yeah, we, we, we just didn't know it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, we didn't intend it. to. Yeah, officially it came out a bit later. Larry One is uh, it's it's a remake of a sorts. I didn't know it. It is. Uh, yeah, I didn't know it. I got into the research and then I found out that there was a game called Soft Porn before Larry. Yeah, yeah. Soft, Soft Porn came out in uh, 1980, I believe. Uh, and was one of the first big hits for the Apple II. At a time when Apple had sold 100,000 Apple IIs, Ken had sold 25,000 copies of software. <laughs> That's quite and a lot. everybody I knew it. had a pirated version. <laughs> so it was pretty much on every Apple II uh, outside of an elementary school, I guess. <laughs> Probably <laughs> but, a few uh, elementary uh, was, schools it also. It was readily really available. available. And... Uh, uh, it was a terrible game. I mean, I don't think Chuck... Benton would mind if I <laughs> if I called it that. I think he'd probably agree. Um, it it, it uh, Chuck wrote it because he bought an Apple II and wanted to write database software. He thought that the future lie in uh, uh, doing um, custom programming for. Uh, garages and gas stations and you know doctor's offices or whatever and he wanted to use the Apple II as a database program and he wasn't sure whether he could handle it so he said I'll write a test case well what's what's a good test case for a database he said I'll write a game and so he wrote this simple game um, that uh, uh, had no protagonist it was an interesting um, lesson in game design because there was no central character there was no uh uh one to follow in the game it was text only uh, because he didn't really want to mess with graphics so uh it was in fact it was he showed it to ken and i think ken enjoyed the the uh context of it and the, the uh and figured that sex would sell which it did which and, it did uh, <laughs> yeah uh but uh, it, it, when I, um, when we lost the rights to the or gave up the rights to the Disney characters, um, Ken asked me, "What do you want to do next?" Because I had just finished Donald Duck's Playground, I think, and uh, King's Quest Three for Roberta. Uh, he said, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "Gosh, I don't know. What do you think?" And he said, "Well, you know, soft porn used to be a big hit, but we got rid of it because of the Disney catalog. Why don't we call Chuck and see if?" Uh, uh, he'll sell us the rights uh, uh, to do a new version of it, and uh, uh, and you could update it with our new uh, 3D graphic programming and uh, 3D you know, graphics. New gra- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two, 280 <laughs> pixels of graphics uh, across. Um, and uh, uh, I said, sure, yeah, that's fine. So um, I said, let me play it first because I haven't played it in five years. Maybe, maybe I don't remember it very well. Uh, so I took the game home and played it for a week and uh, uh, got through it barely. Um, but uh, uh, I came back and he, Ken was in a meeting with. He said, "Well, how did it go?" And I said, "Oh God, Ken, this game is so out of touch. It should be wearing a leisure suit." And I got a laugh, uh, <laughs> and I thought, "Oh, leisure suits are funny." And he said, "Well, could you do a update of the game?" And I said, "No, nah, it's I don't think so. The only way I can do this is if you'd let me make fun of it." And he said, "Oh, well, that'd be good." And I said, "Okay, well, um, all right." So I went home, and then I kind of thought, "What have I done? I don't know how to write a comedy. I've never written a comedy. What do I know about comedy, uh, other than?" You know, I enjoyed watching comedians over the years and comedy shows and comedy books. And I thought, gosh, people like all those forms of comedy. Why wouldn't they laugh at a computer game? Uh, It's just that nobody's done one. Uh, um, And Well, I say nobody. I think Steve Moretzky did some funny stuff uh, for Infocom back in the early 80s. uh, Space Quest might be considered a humor game. Space Quest was later. later. Oh, yeah, it was released released later. Okay. I was. Yeah. I always yeah. thought that it was about the same time, but yeah. 
Well, well uh, uh, sure, roughly, roughly, roughly yes. yes. Roughly <laughs> Same decade, at least. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, I had never seen or heard of Space Quest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even yeah. though, I mean, I think maybe Scott and Mark were working on it at that time. I don't I don't think so. Uh, because, um, yeah, it was, you are correct. I'm wrong. Because, uh, here's why I know. Uh, because Sierra was uh, very limited in the people that, could use the tools up here because people don't realize that uh, those games were made before there was a Photoshop. <laughs> Quite a bit before there was a Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, and and you say that to people, and you, you, people go, "What before Photoshop? How could you? You know, you can't <laughs> you can't do anything on a computer without Photoshop." Um, but literally, we had to. We, I mean, not me, somebody who was really a good programmer, uh, had to build the tools that they used to make the background images on the screen. Uh, another person built the tools they used to animate the characters on the screen. Another person built the program that was used to create the music in the games and on and on. A font editor. We had to build our own font editor. There was no font <laughs> editors. I, I mean... <laughs> Okay. Pretty That's basic, but primitive and basic. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so so anyway, there were there were very few people who knew how to use these tools, and of course, at the time, you artists were in particularly short supply. Uh, people that went into art then uh, were not the people who went into computers. It was just they were just two opposite things because you know one was very creative and and uh, very left brain, and the other was just totally right brain. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, the two didn't go together. So we had real trouble finding artists uh, to, who could learn to use the tools. I remember when we were working on a, one game, and uh, uh, I, I, I walked in on one of the artists, and he was uh, all upset and mad. And I said, what happened? He said, he said, well, I lost my... Uh, uh, picture I was doing. I lost the, the, the accent. Well, how long have you worked on it? And he said, well, all day. And I just put five. I've, I've been, been working, working on five hours. hours. And I said, <laughs> well, why did you save it? No, it wasn't done. Oh, that, that was the level that hurt. of people. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. That's, That's the level of people that, uh, that we had. Yeah, so, so, I mean, we were very uh, limited. So, so, anyway, when it came time to work on Larry, uh, I think there were three people who knew how to use the tools that we use to create the graphics, uh, and Mark Crow being one of them. Um, and they they made Mark a deal. They said, if you'll keep working on Space Quest during the day uh, and work on Larry at night and weekends, uh, then we'll give you a, a, a certain royalty. And, um, and uh, if you take longer than four weeks, I believe it was. Yeah. If you take uh, a month, we'll give you this royalty. If you take uh, longer, we'll t give you less. And if you take, you know, six weeks, we'll give you less. And, and um, anyway, he finished in a month. Uh, all uh, While he was working 40 hours a week at Space Quest, he uh, worked uh, evenings and, and uh, weekends and did all the art, including the backgrounds, the credits, the box, the art, uh, everything in the game um, uh, for Larry One. Yeah. It was a different time. Yeah, I, I read some interviews and books about that time period at Sierra. It almost gave me a feeling that it was like a group of friends or even family, like having fun and making games. <laughs> it, was it like that? That's, That's exactly, exactly what it was. <laughs> yeah. I, it, you know, we had no feedback from anybody. I mean, we shipped a lot of games. We saw we saw trucks leave the warehouse, you know, <laughs> with with lots of boxes. But we never heard back from anybody that they liked the game or they didn't like it. I mean, we read reviews in magazines months later, uh, but there were no comments pages. There was no there was no feedback uh, from anybody. Um, I mean, I guess in the course of my career there, I probably got a dozen letters from people. It just, people didn't take the time to do that. They were busy to solve. They wanted to solve the game. 
they called the hint line a lot. They asked <laughs> yes. Hints, they, you know, but, uh, but as far as telling us what they thought of the games, we didn't really get that. So I, I wrote, and I think Scott and Mark did too, we wrote for each other. You know, we wanted to, to please Ken and Roberta and Jim Walls and Scott and Mark and all the other gang that was a Bob Heitman and Jeff Stevenson. We wanted them to like uh, the games and they gave us feedback. But um, God, we weren't in Silicon Valley. We weren't by the other game companies. Uh, I know we traded product with other people. We gave games to LucasArts and they gave us games back. And that was all. That was cool. We like getting free games, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but who doesn't? That was about it, as far as feedback was concerned. Yeah, um, actually, when I uh, told a friend of mine that we are going to have a talk, I would get the honor. Uh, he uh, asked me to uh, ask you that: Did you uh, realize, or when did you realize that you have awoken a lot of things in impressionable young men? <laughs> <laughs> How long were you in the business before you realized well, that something is happening? Remember, I I was a school teacher. I taught high school and and uh, middle school, uh, intermediate school aged kids. So I understand um, adolescent youth and uh, and also you know I didn't I didn't know how to write. Well, none of us knew how to write games when we started. There were no books. There were no classes. There were no schools. Um, the only way you learned was by playing games and seeing what uh, somebody else did that you liked uh, or didn't like. And I would say, oh, well, I'm never going to do that. Or, oh, I like that. I'll steal that idea. Um, uh, but, uh, but, but none of us had any education or training um, or background. You know, there was... I remember... When I bought my Apple II, I called the local university and said, uh, can I take a class in programming? And they said, sure. Do you want Fortran or COBOL? <laughs> yeah, so, not neither. exactly I, game. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So I taught myself assembly language. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Larry, Larry was quite. It followed the plot of soft porn. Larry hooks up, comes to lost wages, hooks up with uh, three women, and lives happily ever after. That's the story, <laughs> basically. Well, um, yeah. Uh, when um, I had done educational software and I had worked uh, with Roberta on uh, programming uh, uh, other games. But I had never uh, done an adult game, a game with typing, where you had actually had to type input. Um, that was my first experience with that. So um, I uh, was happy to take the idea of soft porn and um, modernize it uh, with the graphics. And but you got to understand, soft porn um, was merely the shell for Larry. Uh, I, I used the puzzles and the locations and one line of text. <laughs> uh, Chuck, Chuck wrote one line of text that I loved and I uh, kept that in the game, but everything else was me. Um, the, the central protagonist, there was no central figure in his game. Uh, the, the computer talked with you like, um, uh, I am your puppet master. Uh, order me about, and I will do thy bidding. <laughs> so, like, it was like, oh, this game is horrible. Um, but uh, so anyway, I kept one line from Chuck and uh, wrote all the rest of the lines myself. And, and I created a protagonist. I wasn't quite sure how to do it, um, but I knew I needed to have some way to make uh, jokes. And I thought, well, the narrator in these games is kind of a, another character. So what if I became the narrator and I had this stooge to make fun of? Um, and uh, I, I thought about the comedies of uh, Buster Keaton and uh, Charlie Chaplin and uh, uh, all those period, those silent comedians from back then. 
and uh, uh, thought, well, that's what I should do. I should do a, um, a character that's kind of an anti-hero that uh, is a, a – then, then I <laughs> – at some point I realized, what have I done? I've created this character that's supposed to be the player, and I keep insulting you. Uh, I, 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 I talk badly to you and, uh, I give you terrible, I uh, put you in terrible situations and I, you know, I'm, you flush the toilet and I, I kill you. <laughs> I mean, there were <laughs> terrible <laughs> things in the game, but, but somehow I guess it worked out in the end. It was, uh, it was a, it was a fun project. 